This is Chapter 14 of Following the Equator. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Following the Equator by Mark Twain, Chapter 14. Bad Health. To Melbourne by Rail. Maps Defective. The Colony of Victoria. A Round Trip Ticket from Sydney. Change Cars from Wide to Narrow Gauge. A Peculiarity at Albury. Customs Fences. My Word. The Blue Mountains. Rabbit Piles. Government Railroad Restaurants. Duchesses for Waiters. Sheep Dip. Railroad Coffee. Things Seen and Not Seen. We can secure other people's approval, if we do right and try hard, but our own is worth a hundred of it, and no way has been found out of securing that. Puddenhead Wilson's New Calendar My health had broken down in New York in May. It had remained in a doubtful but fairish condition during a succeeding period of eighty-two days. It broke again on the Pacific. It broke again in Sydney but not until after I had had a good outing, and had also filled my lecture engagements. This latest break lost me the chance of seeing Queensland. In the circumstances, to go north toward hotter weather was not advisable. So we moved south with a westward slant, seventeen hours by rail to the capital of the colony of Victoria, Melbourne, that juvenile city of sixty years and half a million inhabitants. On the map the distance looked small, but that is a trouble with all divisions of distance in such a vast country as Australia. The colony of Victoria itself looks small on the map, looks like a county, in fact, yet it is about as large as England, Scotland, and Wales combined, or, to get another focus upon it, it is just eighty times as large as the state of Rhode Island, and one-third as large as the state of Texas. Outside of Melbourne, Victoria seems to be owned by a handful of squatters, each with a Rhode Island for a sheep farm. That is the impression which one gathers from common talk. Yet the wool industry of Victoria is by no means so great as that of New South Wales. The climate of Victoria is favorable to other great industries, among others wheat growing and the making of wine. We took the train at Sydney at about four in the afternoon. It was American in one way, for we had a most rational sleeping-car. Also the car was clean and fine and new, nothing about it to suggest the rolling stock of the continent of Europe. But our baggage was weighed, and extra weight charged for. That was continental. Continental and troublesome. Any detail of railroading that is not troublesome cannot honorably be described as continental. The tickets were round-trip ones, to Melbourne and clear to Adelaide in South Australia, and then all the way back to Sydney, twelve hundred more miles than we really expected to make. But then, as the round-trip wouldn't cost much more than the single trip, it seemed well enough to buy as many miles as one could afford, even if one was not likely to need them. A human being has a natural desire to have more of a good thing than he needs. Now comes a singular thing, the oddest thing, the strangest thing, the most baffling and unaccountable marvel that Australasia can show. At the frontier between New South Wales and Victoria, our multitude of passengers were routed out of their snug beds by lantern light in the morning in the biting cold of a high altitude to change cars on a road that has no break in it from Sydney to Melbourne. Think of the paralysis of intellect that gave that idea birth. Imagine the boulder it emerged from on some petrified legislator's shoulders. It is a narrow-gauge road to the frontier, and a broader gauge thence to Melbourne. The two governments were the builders of the road, and are the owners of it. One or two reasons are given for this curious state of things. One is that it represents the jealousy existing between the colonies, the two most important colonies of Australasia. What the other one is, I have forgotten, but it is of no consequence. It could be but another effort to explain the inexplicable. All passengers fret at the double gauge. All shippers of freight must, of course, fret at it. Unnecessary expense, delay, and annoyance are imposed upon everybody concerned 
and no one is benefited. Each Australian colony fences itself off from its neighbor with a custom-house. Personally, I have no objection, but it must be a good deal of inconvenience to the people. We have something resembling it here and there in America, but it goes by another name. The large empire of the Pacific coast requires a world of iron machinery, and could manufacture it economically on the spot if the imposts on foreign iron were removed, but they are not. Protection to Pennsylvania and Alabama forbids it. The result to the Pacific coast is the same as if there were several rows of custom fences between the coast and the east. Iron carted across the American continent at luxurious railway rates would be valuable enough to be coined when it arrived. We changed cars. This was at Albury, and it was there, I think, that the growing day and the early sun exposed the distant range called the Blue Mountains, accurately named. My word! as the Australians say, but it was a stunning color, that blue, deep, strong, rich, exquisite, towering and majestic masses of blue, a softly luminous blue, a smoldering blue, as if vaguely lit by fires within. It extinguished the blue of the sky, made it pallid and unwholesome, whitey and washed out, a wonderful color, just divine. A resident told me that those were not mountains. He said they were rabbit-piles, and explained that long exposure and the overripe condition of the rabbits was what made them look so blue. This man may have been right, but much reading of books of travel has made me distrustful of gratis information furnished by unofficial residents of a country. The facts which such people give to travelers are usually erroneous, and often intemperately so. The rabbit plague has indeed been very bad in Australia, and it could account for one mountain, but not for a mountain range, it seems to me. It is too large an order. We breakfasted at the station. A good breakfast, except the coffee, and cheap. The government establishes the prices and placards them. The waiters were men, I think, but that is not usual in Australasia. The usual thing is to have girls. Uh, no, not girls young ladies, generally duchesses. Dress? They would attract attention at any royal levy in Europe. Even empresses and queens do not dress as they do. Not that they could not afford it, perhaps, but they would not know how. All the pleasant morning we slid smoothly along over the plains, through thin, not thick, forests of great melancholy gum-trees, with trunks rugged with curled sheets of flaking bark, erysipelous convalescents, so to speak, shedding their dead skins. And all along were tiny cabins, built sometimes of wood, sometimes of grey-blue corrugated iron, and the doorsteps and fences were clogged with children, rugged little simply-clad chaps that looked as if they had been imported from the banks of the Mississippi without breaking bulk. And there were little villages, with neat stations well placarded with showy advertisements, mainly of almost two self-righteous brands of sheep-dip, if that is the name, and I think it is. It is a stuff like tar, and is dabbed on to places where the shearer clips a piece out of the sheep. It bars out the flies, and has healing properties, and a nip to it which makes the sheep skip like the cattle on a thousand hills. It is not good to eat, that is, it is not good to eat except when mixed with railroad coffee. It improves railroad coffee. Without it, railroad coffee is too vague, but with it it is quite assertive and enthusiastic. By itself, railroad coffee is too passive, but sheep dip makes it wake up and get down to business. I wonder where they get railroad coffee. We saw birds, but not a kangaroo, not an emu, not an ornithorhynchus, not a lecturer, not a native. Indeed, the land seemed quite destitute of game. But I have misused the word native. In Australia it is applied to Australian-born whites only. I should have said that we saw no aboriginals, no black fellows. And to this day I have never seen one. In the great museums you will find all the other curiosities, but in the curio of chiefest interest to the stranger all of them are lacking. We have at home an abundance of museums, and not an American Indian in them. It is clearly an absurdity, 
but it never struck me before. End of chapter 14